Thank you to the team uh, for leading us this morning. If you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to Romans 1. That'll be our text today, Romans 1. As you're turning there, it seems since uh, almost the late 90s, maybe early 90s. <laughs> I didn't, yeah, 90s. The music was terrible, no. <laughs> Actually, I thought the music was good. Um, in, the, in about the 90s, uh, the evangelical movement kind of uh, hit its ascendancy, its, its, its peak. And, and ironically, at the same time, the rise of almost the embarrassment of Christianity uh, rose in the Western world. And you got uh, almost viral ideas that if it wasn't for Christianity, the world would be so much uh, more advanced and and Christianity is an embarrassment, an archaic religion, a, a problem that needs to be solved. And so we saw the rise of movements like the evangelical uh, atheist movements, uh, which is ironic in itself. Um, you know, Richard Dawkins kind of became very popular, Christopher Hitchens, Sam Harris, uh, these thinkers that started to lambaste the idiocy of Christianity. Go forward 30 years, and the world has, at least in the West, largely abandoned the faith that established it. And we're starting to see the outworkings of that. Uh, that a world without Christianity is not more advanced, it's full of more chaos, it's more backwards, and it has not the strength that built the world that we, most of us, grew up in. And so what we want to talk about today is the fact that we have good news. We've got good news for the world. But unfortunately, in the 20th century, we abandoned that good news for a moralism, for an idea of how to be good people. And that doesn't work. I mean, just imagine a world, imagine a world where nothing ever goes wrong. Imagine a world where... There is goodness in literally everything that you do. Enjoyment in your work. Life never stops being the adventure it was when you were maybe a child. Each moment more enjoyable than the last. And each point of experience not lost with the longing for a better one. But simply enjoyed for what it is. The moment as a gift. Church, that's the world God made us for. That's the world God designed. This is the garden that God set us in. The bad news is we don't live in that. We don't live in that even remotely. I don't think anyone would look at the world today and say, this is the garden of Eden. We are constantly frustrated, constantly beset with pain and strife. And the older you get, at least this is my experience, the less hopeful the world seems. It seems that life itself seems to suck the joy out of existence. Frustration, pain, setback. And so we ask the question, what went wrong? Why is there so much struggle? Is there a hope for this world? Is there simply good news for the world? That's the question we're going to be asking today. I'll answer it. Next week we'll look at the question, is there good news for the church? Now when we think of good news, when we think of the gospel... Since the 90s, it was reduced down to the phrase, Jesus loves you, which is true. But it's so dripping with sentimentality as to lose any kind of meaning to anyone except for people who've grown up in this kind of cultural milieu of Christianity. What does it mean that Jesus loves me if my life is still a mess? What does it mean if Jesus loves me if I can't get a job? And I want to show you this morning that Jesus loves you is true, but it's sentimental. And what we have is not sentimental. We have a very powerful, very hopeful, very good news for the church, for the world, sorry. And so let's read together in Romans 1 as we deal with this today. I'm going to read from verse 1 all the way through to verse 17. 
Now we'll be using this as a launching pad to this theme. So Romans 1. Paul, a servant of Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the good news of God. The good news he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures regarding his son, who as to his earthly life was a descendant of David, and through the spirit of holiness was appointed the Son of God in power by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through him we receive grace and apostleship, to call all the Gentiles to the obedience that comes from faith for His namesake. And you also are among the Gentiles who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all in Rome who are loved by God and called to be His holy people. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I want to thank God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith is being reported all over the world. God, whom I serve in spirit, is preaching through the gospel of His Son, is my witness of how constantly I remember you in my prayers at all time. And I pray that now, at last, by God's will, the way may be open for me to come to you. I long to see you so that I might impart some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is, that you and I might be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I plan many times to come to you, but I've been prevented from doing so until now, in order that I might have a harvest among you, just as I've had a harvest among other Gentiles. I'm obliged both to Greeks and non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish, and that is why I'm so eager to preach the gospel, the good news, also to you in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, first to the Jew, then to the Gentile. For the gospel, sorry, for in the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, a righteousness that comes by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word this morning. Now, Paul shares with this small church that effectively becomes one of the most powerful churches in the world. A couple of hundred years from Paul's letter, this church would be, in a sense, the central ruling part of the world. It becomes incredibly powerful from one simple idea, the gospel, the good news. And so what is this? What is this good news that changed Europe? Well, if we're going to get to the good news, we have to unpack the bad news. What's the bad news? Well, it's pretty simple. The world is not as it should be. It doesn't take a rocket science to look out there and look at the world and say, something is wrong. The world is messed up. There's crime, there's corruption, there's waste. Added to this, there's pain, there's violence, there's hatred, there's mistrust. When one looks around, it seems the world is broken. And it is. Over and over again, people tag on to this idea and make out that the world is so messed up that it has to end, or at least humanity has to end. There was an article that was released in the New York Times Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, where a man says, human beings are so bad that not one of them should be left alive. I mean, that's just genocidal. I mean, painfully so. But there is an anti-human idea that's permeating through the world that, you know what, the world's messed up, it's terrible. You know what's wrong with the world? People. Let's get rid of them. They're a virus. They're a plague on the planet. And so enter the climate catastrophists, the apocalyptics, the doomsayers, the end of world cults, the anti-human doctrines that permeate our world and say, it is so messed up, this world has to end, or at least humanity. You know what? The Bible is actually not um, far off that point. Sadly enough, 
the Bible has a pretty bleak interpretation of what the destiny of the world is. It says destruction. And so these people are tapping into something that is true. The world is destined to end. Revelation 21 verse 1, I saw that the new heavens and new earth, for the first heavens and the first earth had passed away. Matthew 13 verse 40, just as weeds are gathered and burned in the fire, so will it be at the end of the age. Other passages, this world be rolled up like a scroll. Other passages, this world will burn by fire. For this world and all its systems will pass away. Over and over and over again in Scripture, there's one conclusion. This world's so broken, it has to end. That's not good news. That's not good news. But why? Well, the bad news continues. It's us. We're the problem. From the opening of Scripture throughout the rest, the faults and crisis of this world are placed upon who? Us. We have moved away from what we were made or designed to do and therefore have plunged this world into chaos. Every single one of us. We love to point fingers. In the early 2000s, the world witnessed one of the great marks of terrorism that hit the world. Two trade world centers uh, collapsed under the weight of the uh, hijacking of planes and plunged the world into chaos. And the world responded with the war on terror. We're going to go out there and find terror and eradicate it. Into the 2010s and we realized that you know where terror lay? In the very seats of power that were trying to root out terror. In other words, evil's not out there. It's not the boogeyman. It's in here. It's in this church. It's in me. We're the problem. It's endemic to the human heart is to take good things and bend them towards evil. There's the great reformer, uh, Martin Luther, who said, um, basically, and that the problem with humanity is that we are bent in upon ourselves. All our thoughts, all our actions, all that we do have us as chief, and so they are corrupted. And that corrupts the world. And then to the third thing that's wrong with the world, which is the tyrants are in charge. It's our bent inness of ourself, my word, just made it up, that causes us to corrupt the world with corrupt leaders. Due to our sin, we have abandoned the true king and therefore have substituted false parodies in his place. Tyranny is not a new thing. In fact, the lack of tyranny is a miracle. Every culture throughout the world have elected kings over them, and these kings have tyrannically ruled over the people. It's just a reality. Their hunger for power and their desire to keep themselves in charge leads to the absolute enslaving of people. But who gives the kings the power? Who gives the tyrants the power? It's not the unwashed masses, it's us. You know, we like to think, especially in, in South Africa, we love to complain about politics, right? Ah, oh, those politicians. So corrupt. Not realizing that it's our corruption that is allowed, the corruption of the politics. One man said, politics is the individual writ large. That's all it is. You know why we elect corrupt leaders? We elect corrupt leaders. It's because we're corrupt. We only think about ourselves. And the sad thing is, this is not just in terms of political leaders. There are other tyrants, spiritual ones, that we happily put in place that corrupt our lives, cause chaos and evil in its place. I mean, Paul would call these principalities and powers and rulers of the dark age spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. The world is filled with enslaving tyrants, spiritual ones. I read an article the other day 
of how um, the chief exorcist of Rome has reported something like a 147% increase in demon possessions throughout Europe over the last couple of years. But why? Because we elect these tyrants over us. We give ourselves over to evil forces. It's not good news. We live in a world which is dark, evil, messed up, filled with tyrants, both physical and spiritual. So what hope is there? What's the good news? What is the good news? Well, the Bible from start to end longs for the individual human being to take up their charge as God's order-bringing creature. God wants the individual to be in charge under Him. From Genesis to Revelation, this God has promised to make the world into what He has always longed it to be. This Garden of Eden. This place where heaven and earth dwell together. Why do you think in Revelation 21 we see Jerusalem descend from the clouds, that heavenly city, and make its place upon the earth? And it says, and God will dwell in their midst because heaven and earth have been bound together. God wants that. That's His desire. But for this to happen, our corruption, our sin, needs to be dealt with. Our self-obsession needs to be eradicated. And those who held us into slavery need to be disarmed. Well, let's start with that. The gospel is that the tyrants have been humiliated. They have. Colossians 2 verse 15 says, Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. It's not weird, have you not thought about this, that in the Western world, democracy rose. Not in the Greek world. In fact, if you follow the Greek philosophy, it was tyranny under a, any other name. Plato's Republic declared that democracy was the elites keeping the cattle class, the peasants, under control. It was not, a, it was not democracy. But in the West, we saw something different. We saw the, the rising of the power of the individual. Why? Because of the permeation of the gospel and the humiliation of the powers. The tyrants were stripped from their only weapon, which was fear. What keeps a people in line? Fear. Where does this fear come from? From death. And that has been dealt with on the cross. There's two things that the cross dealt with, church. There's two things that are in fact good news. One, death has been eradicated. That's important. But the second thing is that condemnation has been dealt with. Romans 8 verse 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This is the ultimate anti-tyranny doctrine. I don't know if you get that. Think about spiritual forces. Think about demonic forces. I know Hollywood loves to, like, um, to play with this idea. The, the evil that lurks in the shadows, right? But what do they hold us in fear with? That they will kill us or condemn us. Both those things have been taken away by the cross. And therefore all tyranny has been eradicated. For what have they left to hold against us? Can they hold us guilty? No. No. Our sins have been paid. Can they hold us in fear of debt? No. We will be with Him. In fact, we see this on the first day the church is filled with the Spirit. The disciples, after fleeing from those who killed their Lord, terrified of death, are filled with the Spirit, and what do they do? They stand before the same 
council that killed Jesus and declare boldly, boldly, the gospel. You killed him, but he has risen from the dead. So much boldness came over them that in a couple of chapters' time, a young deacon, a man named Stephen, filled with the Spirit, would stand and boldly declare, so boldly, this same gospel that the council would take him outside and kill him. And what was his words as they threw the stones and tried to take his life? Forgive them, Father. They don't know what they do. The very words of Jesus. And behold, I see the Son of God sitting at the right hand of God the Father. There was no tyranny in that man's life. There was no fear. There was only good news. You see, if death is the end, and you are in your sins, you can't be sure of what's next. It's terrifying. And because of that, the tyrants can use that against us, both spiritual and real. As I said, the cross disarms this. The cross once and for all time destroyed guilt. Every sin has been paid. Every sin. And this means something beautiful. It's not just anti-tyranny. It's anti-self-tyranny. Remember my first statement of the good news. Imagine if every action was just an adventure. There was no frustration, but everything was there to just be enjoyed. Well, this is the second part of the good news. Is real rest is offered. You know why we're frustrated in our work, in what we do, in our family life, in our finances? I think it's because we make too much of them. Too much of our happiness, too much of our self-rightness is bound up in these things. And so they crush us with the burden of work. Why are you working so hard? Why are you so frantic? Why are you so full of anxiety? Because you have to prove yourself, right? You have to. The gospel says that's not true. Michael Heiser, I love this statement. Uh, the famous Old Testament scholar said, What you couldn't gain by moral perfection, you can't lose by moral imperfection. I love that statement. We are given grace, God's righteousness, by no moral achievement of our own. That is what we have been given. Which means, nothing can take that away from you. This means that no immoral work, no mess up, no failure will ever take away what was given to you in Jesus. Because why? It was given to you in Jesus. To quote the opposite side of the equation, um, oh, I've just gone blank. MacArthur, John MacArthur. He said, If I was able to lose my salvation, I already would have. You, you can't lose what you could not gain. It was given to you. Now, does that mean you can go and sin that my grace might abound? Of course not. Of course not. We're called to holiness, but it does mean that if you believe, you are secure. And that means for the first time in your life, you can actually rest. You can actually stop. The burden of trying to prove yourself is gone forever. It's already been achieved. What more can you add to the fact that the one who made you, the one who designed you, is wholly pleased with you? You can't. You can't add to that. You can rest in your work. You can rest in your life. Remember on the seventh day, God made the world in six days. On the seventh day, God rested from His works. 
In the Old Testament, in the law, this was commanded to be a remembrance of the Jewish people. That on the, there was before, you are to work for six days, but on the seventh you shall rest from your work. Well, in Jesus' church, everyone rests from their work. Everyone. In Jesus, it doesn't matter. In fact, it just becomes an adventure. Let me throw it out this way. If Jesus really died for you, if you are the greatest businessman in the world or the worst one, Jesus still died for you. If Jesus died for you, if you're the best mother or the worst mother, Jesus still died for you. If Jesus died for you, nothing else can add to that reality. God looks at you and says, I love you because Jesus died for you. You see the rest in that? You see the freedom in that? There's nothing we can add. And this leads us to our third and final point, which is faith solves our problems. In fact, this is the full sum of the total of the good news that we offer the world. Is that you can have be peace with God, you can have peace with your life, you can have peace with the world, and no fear of anything. Why? Because you believe. Paul says it right. It's by faith from first to last. The just shall live by faith. By faith. By faith we receive the promise of salvation. By faith we accept the forgiveness of sin. By faith we hope in the eternal life to come. It's faith that carries us. Faith that helps us. And faith that lets us endure in a world where we cannot see our home right now. Faith carries us into the arms of God and makes us His friend. And faith secures in us His goodness and confirms in us His love. Faith. Faith. Nothing you can do can change that. That is the good news. That is the good news. God loves you in Jesus because of faith. Not because you're a good Christian. Not because you have anything to offer Him. But because of faith. When we get that church, all our stress, all our manipulating, all our tireless struggling to prove ourselves falls away into a kind of silliness. Who are you trying to impress? Who are you trying to impress? I mean, I say this kind of tongue-in-cheek because even me, I believe this. I believe that God loves me. And yet the weight of trying to prove myself still hangs over me constantly. Right? Of course it does. I'm sure it's for you as well. But there's good news. You don't have to live in the burden of that weight. You have everything that you've deep down longed for in Jesus. You have unfretted access to God. You have access to His Word because of Jesus. More than this. More than this. He sees you as His child. That's the good news. You're not alone in this cruel world. You're not abandoned. You belong. And you will continue to belong when everything fails. You will continue to belong when you fail. And you will continue to belong when this world fails. Why? Simply because Jesus actually paid it all. It's the end of work. It's the end of striving. And it's the end of tyranny. 
This is what we offer the world. That is the good news. And church, I hope you see today it's not sentimental. It really isn't. It's powerful, it's deep, it's bold, and it's clear. And the beauty of it is you get to share it. So many of us are terrified of sharing the good news. You know why? Because we're still stuck in the bad news. I need to be well versed in this. I need to know enough. I need to have enough behind me. I need to be good enough to share this. You're still in the bad news. The good news is that I am a bad person. I have done nothing to earn what has been given to me, but God in His grace has given me His love. Now go share that. You see how simple it is? That's why he says, be his witness, not your own. This is what we're called to. Next week, I really hope to show you that this means good news for us who belong here in this church. In fact, how do we make this real here in this community? But for the meantime, I'll give you the same commission that Jesus gave his first disciples. Go. Be his witnesses. Let's pray. Jesus, we share in this longing, in this goodness, in this grace that you've given us. That indeed our our lives make sense in Jesus. And every single one of us I'm sure here this morning can attest to the fact that you have been far better to us than we deserve and continue to do so, not because of anything that we have actually done, but because of your faithfulness and because of the work of Jesus. Boasting ends in the gospel because work ends in the gospel. And so I pray that we would be bold declarers, bold livers of this good news, and that you bring glory to yourself through this in Jesus' name. Amen. Why don't you stand as we sing our closing song?